Dear Internet, One of the greatest pleasures I've had since I've started doing requested reviews is being introduced to things I would never have considered otherwise. From the confusing and emotion-twisting roadways of Rama one half, to the hills and valleys of Cyber 6, to the vast ocean of mediocrity in the works of Brandon Sanderson. But now something else is on the horizon. Something completely off the map. And I'm not sure the Paparina Traveling Internet show is up to the task. There's just so much of it. A 500-page book, a 13-episode television show, all from a country I know very little about except from what I've seen in Peter Jackson movies. There's so much to talk about, like young adult literature in a post-Harry Potter world, the relation between books and television, the differences between science fiction and fantasy, the works of singular artists versus the works of collaborative artists. So much to take on, so little time to do so. I promised everybody that I would complete these requests, but dear internet, first I must find a way to conquer Madigan's Fantasia. On June 26, 1997, a book by an unknown author was published in the UK. It was 223 pages long and was a clumsy effort of a new writer, with a plotting episodic format and amateur prose style that includes such awkward moments as comparing a giant's feet to baby dolphins. The magical setting was largely derivative of other works and was ultimately a western middle-class fantasy, the social struggles of rich people and authority figures and bland ultimate evil baddies. That book was Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone by J.K. Rowling, and it would become one of the most successful books of all time. Three months earlier, a book by successful New Zealand author Margaret May was published. It was called The Five Sisters, an 80-page long fairy tale about five paper dolls who are whisked away by the wind and find themselves on a journey of self-identity and purpose. Margaret May tied together an original plot with universal appeal with a lyrical prose style that was almost poetic, rich in learned metaphor that came from 30 years of experience writing picture books, short stories, and young adult novels. While the book was not a failure by any means, it naturally was nowhere close to the cultural event that was Harry Potter. Harry Potter was the Star Wars moment for what is collectively considered young adult literature. Like Star Wars, it was big and clumsy and nobody was really sure it would work, but something about it really resonated with readers to the point where it became a part of mainstream popular culture like no other book had in the last 50 years. And like Star Wars, its success heralded in a new business model, moving young adult literature away from the smaller, more delicately crafted books like The Five Sisters and away from the cheaper serialized pulp stuff like Goosebumps and Animorphs into a world of big, blockbuster event books. That, of course, could be more easily turned into big blockbuster event movies. Oh, and that was the other important thing, the relation between this new stage in young adult literature and the transition into the visual medium, as the Harry Potter films were just as relatively successful as their book counterparts. This wasn't exactly a new thing, but there was a heightened emphasis on getting works of fiction across different medias at a breakneck pace usually going from book to film in three to four years. This was the new market that seasoned authors like Margaret May found themselves in, found themselves having to adapt to. Not that there still wasn't a place for smaller books. Literature tends to be a far more flexible market, especially compared to film. But May still decided to take a crack at it in 2007 with Madigan's Fantasia. Of course, this is not to say that Madigan's Fantasia is a Harry Potter ripoff. It doesn't deal with schools or evil bad guys of the past or characters dealing with prophecy or a ma- Well, actually, it has magic, but this is science fiction, so it's a vague scientific magic, like midichlorians or something. And the story has time travel, so I guess the difference between prophecy and some guys who know how it happened after the fact is just a matter of semantics. And now the evil Voldemort-type bad guys from the future, too. 
Okay, so there's no school stuff, instead opting for a more Lord of the Rings-style travel adventure while keeping the focus on the Harry Potter-aged characters. Alright, I'm not being fair here, because Madigan's Fantasia is actually a really compelling concept. It's long after the apocalypse, a century or more after the cataclysm that overturned civilization, and now everyone lives in small, contained societies separated by miles of wilderness and roaming bandits. The most grand of these societies is the City of Solace, which keeps itself together through the use of a solar power, but the solar converter is wearing out, and if a new one isn't found soon, Solace could fall into darkness. So they hire the help of Madigan's Fantasia, a traveling circus, to cross the globe and find one in time. However, things quickly take a turn for the worse when the Fantasia is attacked by bandits and their leader, Ferdy Madigan, is killed along with their navigator. At the same time, two young boys and a baby girl, Tymon, Eden, and Jewel respectively, seem to appear out of nowhere and introduce themselves to Ferdy's 14-year-old daughter, Garland. They claim to be refugees from a distant future where the Fantasia failed in its quest. Solace fell and the world is now under the control of a near-immortal mutant called the Nenog. Two of the Nenog's henchmen, the human Ozul and the robot Mosca, have followed the boys through time, partially to prevent them from changing history and partially to claim a powerful object they're carrying called the Talisman, which gives Eden powers that are near godlike. And that's just the most basic setup, which doesn't cover any of the actual episodic adventures the Fantasia find themselves in, uh, the power struggle within the leaderless Fantasia, and the mysterious silver girl that only Garland can see. It's a plot of Belooza in here! To Margaret May's credit, everything does eventually get resolved. There's no subplots left dangling by the final chapter, no real mysteries left unsolved, which seems to suggest she didn't have much interest in turning Madigan's Fantasia into a Harry Potter-style book franchise. The reasons for this is unclear, but I think a deciding factor might be that May didn't actually seem to enjoy writing this kind of stuff. I can't confirm that with anything directly, I don't have any quotes or stories to back that up, and a lot is inferred from simply scanning through her bibliography. She wrote over 150 books, and there's no way I'm getting through that anytime soon. But by all appearances, the ratio of actual adventure books versus May's more fairy tale, whimsical fantasy stuff is staggeringly lopsided. I can't say if Margaret May enjoyed writing Young Adventure. But I can say this much. She wasn't very good at it. In terms of prose style, pacing, characterization, what is shown and what is implied, Madigan's Fantasia is a mess. My reading of the book was just nonstop, okay, what was that about? And was that really the best way to write that? And wait, what just happened? I'm not going to lie, out of all the requested books thus far, this one was the hardest to get through. And I don't mean that as a slight against the person who made the request, and I'm not saying you are not allowed to enjoy this book, but it seemed to be doing everything that personally annoys me. Here's a small sample. Ozul moved in on them. Tymon passed Jewel to Eden, then leaped to his feet, prepared to defend Jewel and to defend Garland, too, perhaps. But it was Eden and Jewel whom Ozul seized, only to drop him and leap away, uttering a cry that was certainly a cry of pain. First, ugly-looking run-on sentence. The second, we have Tymon get up onto his feet to defend his friends, but Ozul takes Eden and Jewel anyway. Um, what exactly happened? Did Ozul push Tymon away? Uh, walk around Tymon while Tymon just stood there like an idiot? Did Tymon throw a punch and miss? We are missing a crucial action beat here, and its exclusion is bizarre. Third, why is Tymon defending Jewel and Garland too, perhaps? What's that supposed to mean? Why is Garland, who is Tymon's friend, semi-love interest, and important figure in the space-time continuum, only on the maybe list of people he intends to protect from the approaching bad guy. Is it because Garland is actually more capable physically than Tymon is and might be able to handle herself? Because if so, it's not communicated well. And why are the two people on Tymon's protect list the two girls in this scene, but not his younger brother Eden? 
Fourth, Ozul seizes Eden and Jewel, but when he lets them go, it says Ozul dropped him, meaning Eden? So does that mean Ozul is still holding Jewel? No, Eden is still holding Jewel, but why not just say them instead of him? Fifth, uttering a cry that was certainly a cry of pain? Just say he uttered a cry of pain! Why add a level of uncertainty to it if that is in fact what happened? Yes, I just spent two solid paragraphs deconstructing all the problems of one sentence, and yes, I think this is a fair representation of this book as a whole. Though as bad as that sentence was, at least it was something that was happening, because the book kind of has a problem showing you things happening. Uh, there's a bit early on when the Fantasia encounters a group of people paid off to stop them by blocking the road and threatening to store their van with boulders if they don't ha hand over the uh, time travel kids. Garland, Tymon, and Eden run away, and in an attempt to hide from Ozul and Mosca, Eden uses his powers to merge them with a tree, which, okay, cool. It's an interesting visual, and it's neat to see Garland float in and out of a, the uncaring lethargy of a plant. But then this happens. In that thread-like way, she was aware of something beyond the flow. A clash and a shouting, and then a different sort of shouting further down the gully. And that thread of old understanding told her that somehow Eve and some of the Fantasia men had left Maddie and Goneril to distract Ida from, with some Fantasia display, and had managed to slide up the slope just as she had done. They were struggling to disarm those men with the levers before they managed to bring any rocks crashing down onto the road below. And they might succeed, because the men with the levers had probably been distracted too. Distracted by the jugglers, perhaps, or by the acrobats, or by the dancing dogs. Only to find themselves part of Bannister's strongman act as Eve, Bannister, and some other men looped in on them. So yes, not only does the action scene that this scenario was building up to happen off screen to borrow a movie term, but is instead guessed by Garland through nonspecific sounds while being too much of a tree to actually give a shit. Instead of witnessing the adventure, our main character just, eh, I don't know, maybe this happened, who cares? Now, when I originally read this, I thought this was because May had decided that the entire book was going to be from Garland's perspective. But in the very next chapter, we get a bit from the point of view of Boomer, another one of the Fantasia kids. So then I thought maybe it's just from the perspective of the younger characters, but, but nope. Here comes a scene between stand-in Fantasia leader Eve and Garland's mother, Maddie Madigan. So really, there is no justification to denying the reader the adventure part of their adventure book. Oh, and Maddie Madigan, do you know how unlikely it is to find someone whose last name is the same as your first name after the apocalypse? The characters suffer a lot too. First off, the majority of the Fantasia have absolutely no personality whatsoever. The actual size of the Fantasia is pretty close to full-size circus, meaning there's a lot of anonymous acrobats and lion tamers walking around, and the book isn't shy to just randomly introduce a random Fantasia employee to take care of something the already introduced characters can't. Not that the established characters have much character anyway. A lot of the key members of the Fantasia are just floating names. It's easy to forget them as you go, so that when you get to the scene where Penrod starts waking everybody up, all you can think is, wait, who's Penrod? I know Tane's the head clown, but you can swap his scenes with other floating names like Nye or Brianna or whoever. I don't know who these people are, so why should I care? It's not like we need complex backstories, we just need a touch of personality, some character quirks, things to make them distinct. We do get Bannister, the strong man who really likes to read, which is okay if it wasn't just set up for the dumbest subplot in the entire book, which I'll get to later. Eve and Maddie are filtered through Garland's perspective of them, which means they're probably not accurate characterizations. I guess the best of the adult characters is Goneril, and she's just a cranky old woman. The children characters fare better, but things are seriously dragged down with Garland as the lead. 
Garland is 14 and in that young teenage stage where and shut up mom and leave me alone and I love the Phantom of the Opera and I'm a grown up I can do what I want is going on. You know how Harry Potter was just the worst when it turned the angst up to 11? Imagine an entire book of that. Garland spends the entire thing thinking that Eve is trying to take over the Fantasia and destroy its legacy, despite Maddie's insistence and Eve proving himself a good person over and over again. In fact, nothing Eve does changes Garland's mind. She only shuts up about it from a completely unrelated incident that just mellows her entirely. Tymon has some interesting things going on, except he spends the majority of the book having his mind altered by the baddies, so it's not like any of it actually means anything. Eden is just luggage that's drug out when some magic needs to happen. The real hero of the book is Boomer, who is more proactive, more selfless, and more action-seeking than any of the other characters. If May had really wanted a female character as a lead, she should have just swapped Garland and Boomer's genders and shifted the focus. It would have made things much more tolerable. And... And... Okay, this is just turning into the usual spiral of negative pandering. I know that's the bread and butter of video reviews, but I feel like I need to back up a bit and take this from a fresh perspective, so... Let's start over. Margaret May was born in New Zealand on March 21, 1936. The Hoover Dam was only 20 days old. The eldest of five children, daughter of a bridge builder and a teacher, she grew up in the town of Wakatane in the eastern bay of the Plenty region in New Zealand's North Island. She went to Auckland University College and Canterbury University College, graduating in 1955, then trained in the New Zealand Library School in Wellington, beginning her career as a librarian. She moved to Christchurch, the largest city in the South Island, where she spent over a decade writing stories alongside being a librarian, most of which were published in the New Zealand Department of Education School Journal. It was in 1969 that Helen Watts, an American author and publisher, discovered May's work and brought it over to the United States, the first being A Lion in the Meadow, a fantastic little picture book about imagination run amok, a nearly meta text about a boy claiming the presence of a lion outside, a mother countering it with an even sillier claim about a dragon, only to reveal that both claims are in fact true. It reads like the anti The Boy Who Cried Wolf, a world where children should always be listened to regardless of how silly they may seem. It's the kind of picture book fantasy that is clearly on the side of children, neither pandering to them or treating their ideas and feelings as inferior. A Lion in the Meadow came out around a time when great focus was being made towards children's media that was respectful to the child. A Lion in the Meadow actually reminds me of the introduction of Snuffleupagus in Sesame Street in 1971, how everyone treated him like Big Bird's imaginary friend until, nope, the guy was real, and all of you should have been taking Big Bird seriously. A Lion in the Meadow was a success, and kicked off May's career that includes perhaps too many books to count, with books still being published after her death in 2012. She's like a picture book Tupac in that regard. I have to admit, the huge bibliography and my lack of cultural knowledge when it comes to New Zealand is a serious obstacle when it comes to getting a bead on what Margaret May was all about. But I think A Lion in the Meadow might be a key text in figuring out what May was trying to accomplish with Madigan's Fantasia despite one being a short picture book and the other being a massive young adult novel. Both books deal with the dueling perspective of children and adults, both deal with magical surrealism, both deal with the misunderstanding of someone's true nature, and both are effectively anti-establishment. Yeah, you heard me. In A Lion in the Meadow, the mother is clueless, unobservant, ignores the deeds of her child until everything is just a huge mess, and only makes things worse by being condescending and not checking things out. She is not really representative of any real parent, but as an authoritative other from the child, and things don't change for the better until the child takes charge of the situation. Madigan's Fantasia is this on a larger scale. 
For the majority of the book, there are two different kinds of plots going on. Either A, the Fantasia have an altercation with Ozul and Mosca, who are representative of a potential dictatorship, or B, the Fantasia arrive at an isolated, post-apocalyptic society, discover corruption in their system of government, and expose it for the betterment of the people. We have Gramp, who uses children slaves to mine oil. We've got the community of the Witchfinder, which is ruled over by a deceitful woman using old technology to manipulate its citizens into believing in supernatural threats. We've got Greentown, which controls people through the use of hallucinogenic drugs. And Newton, a failed technocracy which turned all Lord of the Flies on them. This is where the book really stops resembling Harry Potter, which was largely pro-establishment. Sure, there were some evil people aligned with the big baddie and the magic government, but Harry Potter was still fighting for the virtues of the old guard, which just so happened to include casual slavery, racism, and police state levels of surveillance. Yeah, if you know me, you know I prefer anti-establishment over pro-establishment any day. It seems fitting that the Fantasia takes on the child role in this comparison, as what more on-the-nose way to represent childhood and imagination than with a circus? The go-to childhood fantasy that nobody ever had is to run away to the circus, and things like Circus Olay and films like Mirror Mask present a divide between real-world circuses and the fantasies one takes away from the circus. To a child and a circus, lions and dragons are just par of the course. And it's just a natural extension of this that the emphasis is on younger characters. And yet again, May doesn't seem terribly interested in engaging in all that subtext. On top of all the prose problems I just covered, it's also plotted poorly. These little overthrow the government subplots don't really seem to have much thought put into them besides what's the neatest image I can make out of this. With Gramp, the Fantasia are given fuel for exposing the child slave thing, which isn't much of an accomplishment seeing as how everyone already knew about it. But more confusing is how the Fantasia managed to get fuel from the evil enslaving government after exposing the evil enslaving government. I guess the Fantasia might try to blackmail them, but again, the people of the city already know! There's protests, there's people trying to smuggle kids out of the city, uh... There's wicked, worried old people looking out the windows. It's, you know, everybody knows. So what we have here is a, you've ruined our operations somehow. You've exposed the thing that everybody knows. We'll take our revenge by giving you what you want. Take that. And then there's the witch hunter thing. The Fantasia are well aware of this place and who the Witch Hunter is, so while on an important mission to save Solace, they figured the best rest stop is a town whose leader is known for calling people witches and sentencing them to execution. Sounds like a safe place to bring a boy who has actual magical godlike powers. And that's before we discovered that the Witch Hunter already has a bit of a grudge with one of the members of the Fantasia. So, who's up for a game of Idiot Ball? Let me bring up just one more subplot, though this one doesn't really fit in with the anti-establishment subplots we've been talking about. We established early on that Madigan's Fantasia is a long-running family business, once run by Garland's great-grandmother Gabriel. Well, wouldn't you know it, but the Fantasia actually stumbles upon Gabriel, still alive and kicking, running a library in the middle of nowhere. Gabriel spends some time gushing over how awesome books are because Margaret May was a librarian, Natch. But then she pressures Garland into staying with her to become her librarian apprentice, and we end up with a hostage situation because you don't break a Madigan promise. Conflict by pinky swear, that's what really gets the kids excited. Oh, and that's where Bannister's book quirk comes in, as they basically trade him for Garland because Bannister might actually be qualified to be a librarian instead of a 14-year-old acrobat. Why is a woman famous for traveling the world in a circus running a library in the middle of nowhere where no one can find it? Also, uh, the Fantasia... I already said the majority of the people in it aren't fleshed out any, the majority of them don't even have names, but at the very least the book should have colorful descriptions of the various circus acts, right? At least some of the conflicts should be resolved through the creative use of circus skills, right? Uh, yeah, that, that doesn't really happen. 
Garland is an acrobat, and those skills come in handy exactly once, right at the end of the book. Maddie is a knife thrower, but that never comes in handy. Bannister is a strong man, but he never strongmans anyone. I already showed you the one time they put on a show to solve a problem, and that happened off screen! There's only one Fantasia performance that's given detail, and that's because it's introducing Eden's powers. The fact that the main characters are part of a circus means, shockingly, little. You could have made them salesmen, or couriers, or any other occupation that requires a group of people to travel. The end result would have been the same. Why bother with the circus stuff if you're not going to do anything with it? Why do any of this if you're not going to do anything with it? It's, it's so frustrating. Every time I think I'm getting somewhere with this book, it, sh it shuts me down. I need to back up again. I, I need to give this one more go. I need to talk about the TV show. When the great chaos changed the face of the world, out of the ashes came Solace, the shining city, our home. Every year we leave Solace to earn some bread, to spread some joy, to entertain. In truth, I've been withholding a very serious piece of information from you guys, a major bit of context. The reason for that was because this is more or less the order I learned the facts myself, and my understanding of these events were further hampered by the internet sources getting dates wrong, saying the book was published in 2005 when it was in fact published in 2007. This is important because everything changes depending on whether or not the book came out before or after the 2006 television series known as Madigan's Quest. This is our reality. Madigan's Quest was a show based on original concepts by Margaret May, but there was no book beforehand. Instead, the concepts and characters were developed for New Zealand television by Gavin Strawhan and Rachel Lang, established television producers and writers for a bunch of shows us Americans haven't seen. Madigan's Fantasia came afterwards, though it was eventually retitled Madigan's Quest to better market the show. The actual relation between the TV show and the book is pretty vague. I don't know if May approached a studio with the idea, or if the studio approached May to come up with the an idea, or if May was already working on the book and the studio caught wind of it and thought it was a winner. I've already mentioned the relation between post-Harry Potter literature and film, the quick book-to-movie turnover that's still going on today, but the book-to-television model seen here is much more reminiscent of the young adult pulp boom of the late 80s and early 90s with things like The Babysitter's Club and Goosebumps and Animorphs. While May was even less of that scene than she was of the post-Harry Potter one, there's a feeling that Madigan's Fantasia might have been better serviced if it had been turned into a series of 8-12 to 100-page books, giving her more room to expand on characters and spacing things out for readers so that it became less of a chore to read, there'd be less burnout. Madigan's Quest seems like a show from an alternate universe where that happened. So, what does it mean that Vatican's Fantasia came out afterwards? Again, this is mostly speculation, but, but one can read the book as a response to the TV show, in that this is May saying, Okay, you saw how they told this story, now here's what really happened. The definitive Madigan, if you will. So, considering that the definitive Madigan has so many problems, the TV show must be even worse, right? Well, it's not. In just about every way, Madigan's Quest is the superior product, and pretty good television to boot. Not spectacular television, not must-see television, but solid, competently made television. The vast majority of the problems I've raised about the book are just not present in the show. Confusing pro style is traded in for straightforward television storytelling, and if that's not an argument for clarity over artistry, I don't know what is. 
The characters are also greatly improved, partially in the writing and partially by the acting. The size of the Fantasia is scaled down considerably, axing the majority of the nameless acrobats and clowns that seem to have been lying around. This tightens the focus a lot, though there's still some room for undeveloped characters. Like this guy. I, I don't know who this guy is. I, I don't think this guy gets a single line throughout 13 episodes. One example of the writing improving characters comes with Eve. In the book, we don't know anything about him besides that he's a single dad and the second in command. Garland's distrust of Eve doesn't come from anything in his character but a mix of teenage angst against the death of her father. In the TV show, Eve is both written and visually coded to be kind of shady to the audience. TV Eve has a past with a capital P. Other members of the Fantasia talk about how Eve owes people money, and we see him gambling. One gets the impression that he's a crappy Han Solo ex-roguish type who ran away from the mob to join the circus. He's also dressed like a cheap Pirates of the Caribbean extra, and an actor, Timothy Baum, whom horror movie fans will probably recognize as Lionel from Peter Jackson's Brain Dead, plays the character with a slightly overinflated ego. All of this makes Garland's distrust of Eve much more palpable. At one point in both versions, the bad guys frame Eve for stealing something. In the book, nobody really believes he did it because he has no reason for it, and that subplot is dropped as quickly as it's brought up. In the TV show, the Fantasia seriously has to entertain the idea because of Eve's past. You tell me which version is better drama. Not everyone gets fleshed out like that in the writing, but just putting solid actors in the roles can do wonders sometimes. Tane the Clown and Goneril have just about as much to do as they did in the books, but their respective actors, Hori Ahipine and Rachel House, add a lot of personality and quirks to their characters just through gesture and inflection, turning blank slates to really likable secondary characters. The plotting is much more thought out as well. Unlike the book, where the Fantasia was traveling an old familiar route and visiting places they visited before, the TV show has the Fantasia traveling into unknown territory. Yeah, exploring strange new worlds tends to scream adventure more than going through the old routine. It also fixes the problems with the Witch Hunter plot, since the Fantasia aren't aware of the dangers of the place and don't know why doing business here is a bad idea. We also see more of the adult members of the Fantasia involved with the plot. The TV version of the Witch Hunter stuff includes Maddie acting as the defense in a I can't believe it's not Salem witch trial. And yes, we actually see the action stuff that was going on while Garland was high on tree. There's actually a lot more of the Fantasia doing circus stuff in the TV version as well. There are more performances, there are more circus skills to solve problems. Pretty much every episode has at least a little bit of show business in it. Oh, oh, and that stupid Gabriel library plot? Well, they mostly ditch that entirely and, re and replace it with one where the Fantasia gets captured and the women are sold into sex, uh, slavery, mm. yeah, uh, less stupid but a lot more icky, I'm afraid. Gabriel does show up, and she does have a library, only it's a mobile library, and oh my god, that's so perfect. A mobile library is so much more useful in this post-apocalyptic setting than a stationary one in the middle of nowhere that nobody knows about, and it makes so much more sense that Gabriel would retire from a traveling circus to running a traveling library. And we don't get any of that awkward hostage exchange stuff, just, you know, sex slavery. Yeah, actually, I, I don't know if that was really a, a fair trade. Ew. Now, the show isn't perfect. Some of the actors aren't up to snuff as others, and sometimes the TV budget really shows. In the book, Newton is a city of science with sturdy, futuristic buildings to withstand frequent earthquakes, divided by a chaotic lower class of sorts and a stuffy upper class. In the TV show, Newton is a community college. The book and the TV show share some convoluted plot points, like a magic medicine that comes from pretty much nowhere, and both versions end with, but that's another story, which is up there with, it was a dark and stormy night as far as hackney lines go. If you are not the never-ending story, I'm sorry, but you don't get to use, but that's another story. Still, Madigan's Quest is the better version of 
just about every department. So if Madigan's Fantasia came afterwards, why didn't it take the good stuff from the show and build from that foundation? Again, we, we can only speculate. Maybe May seriously thought her version was superior for whatever weird reason. Maybe the book was more or less the material she gave the television producers and was hardly edited afterwards, instead just being rushed into publication when the TV series was a success. Maybe May didn't have the rights to novelize the ideas that were not directly her creations, like maybe one of the TV writers came up with the mobile library thing and thus May couldn't use it in her version. Until more information comes to light, all we can do is speculate. I'm afraid Madigan's Fantasia is a failed book. But you know what? Out of all the material I've covered that I would call bad, this book makes up for it, for its interesting and unique place in our world. Its relation to trends in literature, its relation to other medias, its relation to its author and the author's past in New Zealand, and everything else makes its existence worth it. Just for the perspective, just for the landmark, Madigan's Fantasia is a tiny but significant dot on the map that is us. Thank you.